Hi, welcome to the Online Jewelry Academy. I'm Professor John R. and I'm your instructor. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make this. And no, it's not a big pair of moose antlers and it's not a mustache. This isn't one of our Halloween videos. It's a sinusoidal steak made from hardwood. Now, tools like this have been around for centuries and people have used them to make all sorts of things, including jewelry, but they were primarily used to make things like spouts and handles for hollow vessels. But in the last 50 years or so, designers like Hecky Seppa and Michael Good have explored a wide variety of techniques that can be utilized to make interesting sculptural forms and sculptural jewelry using this tool. Now, in another video, I demonstrate how to use this tool to make a jewelry item. So let me clear the decks here and I'll show you the tools that you need to make this tool. Okay, I've laid out the tools that you're going to need. First, you're gonna need a ruler. The ruler could be substituted with a T-square that has a measuring device printed on it, but a ruler works just fine. You're gonna need a marking pen or pencil. I like to use a compass just so that I can get an accurate measurement of the circles that I'm going to be tracing. And of course you're going to need a variety of drill bits. I have a one and a quarter, one and a half, and two and an eighth hole cutter. Hole cutters are great for this project. I also have a one inch and a three quarter inch spade bit and a half inch twist bit. These are going to be fine going through this wood. The wood is a five inch by ten inch plank of one inch thick hardwood. Now, if you don't have a source in your area for hardwood, you can do a substitution with a cutting board. But just remember that the cutting board is a laminate, which means that there are several little planks that are glued together. So I can't guarantee how long a tool made from a cutting board will last, but this is a good substitution because this is hardwood. All right, the other things that you're going to need are a variety of files and rasps that are good for wood. Wood tools have a little bit bigger teeth or the teeth are separated more so that they don't clog. So you don't want to use metal tools on this. You'll also need a variety of sandpapers going from a very coarse grit to about a 100 or 150 grit because you want to get the edges kind of smooth on this. All right, so let me show you the first step of getting started on this project. What you need to do is you need to measure to find the center of your five inch by 10 inch board. So I've already marked the board at two and a half and five inches, and now I'll draw the lines to find the center point because it's important to know where the center of the board is. After you get that traced out, then what you want to do is just lay out the drilling tools that you're going to be using. And like I said, these are great because it's easy to look through them and find the center. And it's important for you to space these out because you want to have a, a little bit of room in between each one of the cutouts. Now, as a rule, what I would tell you is you probably want to leave about at least a quarter of an inch on the end and you want to have at least a quarter inch separation between each of the cutting tools. So once they're laid out, it's pretty easy to, to trace around ones like this. You can just go around it. These may require that you use the compass. Now this first one is a one inch drill bit. So what I've done is I've preset the compass to a half inch and then I can put the graphite side against where the outer edge of the bit is and that will allow me to push my center into the center line and trace where that drill bit is going to cut a hole. If you got a little confused from that, then voila, here it is. Something easier to follow. Now you can see that we have center lines on the plank so that we know where dead center is on this. And you can see that the largest tool was centered in the middle. And then the other tools were just spaced apart with some distance in between. We eyeballed it. Now you can give this as much room or as little room as you want, but don't forget that the separations between the holes is actually a functional and very useful part of this tool. 
I've also measured from the center line out one and a half inches on either side. That's because I have a three inch vise that this has to fit into. I want to know where it's going to sit. And I've come up two inches from the bottom and one inch below this center line here and connected the two. Now that enables me to cut away this corner. And the reason why I want to be able to cut away the corner there is because if I'm working on something like a a cuff bracelet that needs to curve dramatically, at least there's room for that particular item to go around and underneath the tool. Okay, let's get to cutting this. Now there are a number of ways that you can go about this. You can be old school and use a hand drill, but in this case I'm going to use a cordless drill. Now let me just say for the record, on this project if you have any hand tools uh, available to you, feel free to use whatever device you think is necessary in order to cut this out correctly without injury. Uh, and if you need help, don't be afraid to ask somebody for help. I'm sure that someone at a lumber yard or maybe even a significant other in your household would be very happy to help you do this. Now when you drill, remember always wear eye protection and the other thing that's very very important is you never want to drill into the top of your bench because you probably either spent a lot of time constructing it or it cost you some money. So have a piece of scrap wood that you can drill into. All right, so I've loaded the largest cutter into the drill bit, or, or into the, the drill first, and I'm just going to start cutting these out. All right, so it's going to be noisy. Bear with me. Okay, I've finished drilling, and I've cut this piece in half. So you could take this side of the piece and cut it out and make a second tool at the same time, or you can just put it on a shelf somewhere and save it for when the other one wears out. Now I also cut away these bottom sections and now we're left with the primary shape for the tool. Now the next thing to be done is to clean up these cutouts a little bit more to make them round, but I want to show you one other thing that you might want to do as well. And that is, if you have your vise, you may want to take the tool and put the tool into the jaws of the vise. Now don't sink it in all the way, just put it in so that the, the jaws of the tool catch it, and then just close it down a little bit, and that's where the tool is going to function. Then take a pen or a pencil and draw a line across the top of the jaw of the vise. Now what this is going to do is it's going to indicate the bottom of a hole. So we're going to take a drill bit and line it up with the vise jaw and just mark. And you want to come in about a half an inch minimum on either side and you can eyeball this like I'm doing right here and you're just going to mark where these holes go. And what these holes are going to be for is I'm going to drill through and put two nuts and bolts on either side or a single nut and bolt on each side. And what that will do is that when the tool is upright and functioning, the two bolts will prevent it from sinking into the vise any further. And that should improve the performance of the piece. So let me drill these holes and finish out the rest of the piece. Okay, we finished the drilling. Let me knock off this sawdust. And you can clearly see we have two identical holes to receive two nuts and bolts. Now the important thing to, to remember when you're putting these bolts in is that you want to have the nut to be exactly the same size as the head of the bolt. It doesn't have to be as thick as the head, but it has to be proportionately the same size. Otherwise, it's, your tool is going to sit lopsided on your vise. So we'll drop the bolts in. And 
and turn it over. After you put the bolts in, you need to put your nuts on. Now, it's important to just put them on loosely at first. Don't tighten them all the way, just get them down. And you can see on this side how there's a flat edge that's going to come into contact with the jaw of the vise. What I want to do is I want to make sure that these are lined up on both sides. That way the tool sits very stable on top of the jaws of the vise. Okay, so let's turn this around and look. And you can see that they're not quite in the right position. So all you need to do is take your pliers and you could simply just position them into the right position, but they're not tight enough. So give it a little bit more of a turn. So I give it maybe a third of a turn, quarter of a turn, and just make sure that they're nice and flat. And you may want to double check yourself, just put the tool back into the vise and tighten it up a little bit. And now it seems very sturdy in the vise. So with this done, we're ready now to shape the tool. And we're going to be using rasps, files, and sandpaper to do this. Now it may take a little while, so I'm going to work on this and I'll be back when I make some progress to show you. Okay, so I've been working on this to rough it into the shape that it needs to be to be an effective tool. Now, I've been working primarily with hand tools and heavier hand tools like rasps. So it has a really rough appearance to it right now. If you have woodworking skills and you have the tools and you know how to work with them safely, I highly recommend that you incorporate those tools into the production of this tool because it takes a lot of elbow grease to make this thing. Either that or set up a swear jar and as you curse your way through it, maybe you'll have enough to buy one. <laughs> but here's the way to do it. This wood, it needed to be thinned out. So I had to rasp along the length of it in order to thin down the ends slightly. And they took on kind of a, a pyramidal shape. Then what I needed to do was to get an overall roundness to the interior curves themselves. And in some cases I was able to take the rasp and just go right through it. In other cases I needed to pick up a finer file and break that edge with the finer file so that I didn't expand the opening. So at this point what I've got is a very, very a, a good looking wooden sinusoidal stake. It has that nice serpentine curve going to it. So it's creating effective areas to work inside the grooves and on the humps. The next two steps are I'm going to use finer files to refine these even more and to give it a better surface so that it can then be sanded and become a workable tool. So let me do some more work and I'll come back when I'm closer to actually having a finished tool. And voila, there it is, the finished hardwood sinusoidal stake. Now I'll be honest, this is a tough project. It takes a lot of elbow grease, but oh my God, it's so rewarding once you finished it because look at it, it's beautiful. It's a work of art. Every curve, every angle of it is smooth and rounded and shaped so that the whole tool is workable. Now. We're not experts at woodworking here at the Online Jewelry Academy, but we have friends who are, and they recommend that once you finish this tool, you should give it a coating of linseed oil. Let that first coat dry for about 24 hours, and then give it a few more coatings over the next couple of days. Just be sure to wipe it down before you use it. Now you may need to recoat it a couple of times a year, but you're going to be cleaning tools anyway, so you can refresh the surface a couple of times a year with a little more of the oil. Now, just a quick review. We started with a 10 inch by 5 inch piece of hardwood cut from a 1 inch plank. And that piece of wood was drilled through with hole cutters and drill bits to produce this blank. Then it was worked with a variety of rasps, files, and sandpaper to produce this beautiful result. Now this should be 
a tool that will be in your tool collection for years to come if you care for it properly. If you like this video, be sure to like it. And remember, you can watch any of the OJA's videos on our website at onlinejewelryacademy.com. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel right now by hitting the button in the lower right hand corner. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you'd like to support the production of future videos, we have fan funding set up on YouTube, and you can also make a donation through our website. Thanks for watching.